microphones. Oh, mute your microphones and um, you can turn off your videos as well for now. That would be great. Thank you. So, um, just see how many people we have with 21. We'll just give it one or two more minutes. Okay, I suppose in the interest of time, um, I'll just um, get off and start, I suppose. Um, so welcome to our second event um, for we Women in Research um, in 2022. My name is Dr. Murray O'Connor. I'm um, a committee member of Women in Research and a research fellow at UCC um, in Cork. Um, in today's event, we will explore the barriers women face in academia and research, um, some of the reasons why women leave um, academia and what can be done to uh, retain women and allow them to succeed in their chosen careers. Um, I'm sure many of you will be able to relate to some of the issues that um, will be discussed this evening um, in this evening's conversation. Um, women and minorities are often overrepresented in, in precarious academic jobs in Ireland and I know research conducted by UCC sociologist Dr O'Keefe found many women are stuck in precarious academic jobs for at least or for 10 years or more with few exit, exit points to secure work um, and that precarity is a major barrier to women staying in academia and I suspect it's one of the many reasons why women leave um, and I suppose in many of the issues that women face have been amplified by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, certainly there's been an uneven burden on women in terms of um, caregiving responsibilities during the pandemic. Um, and some women have had to leave the work, their workforce. Um, and I suppose myself as an experienced yet persistent short-term contract researcher who's just returned from her second mat leave um, in three years, um, tonight's topic is very close to my heart. Um, Tonight's event will last uh, approximately one hour um, and we will take questions at the end of the speakers talking. Um, so if you have any questions, you can type them into the chat box um, uh, during the event or if anything strikes you, you can type them into the chat box during the event. So again, since we're recording, if you can please keep your video off and your audio muted. Um, I apologize in advance for any noise on my end, but I have a toddler and a baby downstairs um, and it's close to bedtime. So hopefully they won't be too disruptive. Um, so I'm delighted to introduce our first panelist this evening and um, is Dr. Rosary um, Griffin. And um, Dr. Rosary Griffin is the interim director of the Center for Global uh, Development at UCC. She also lectures and researches in um, education for global sustainment development and um, gender disabilities, gender disability studies and research methodology um, to undergraduate and postgraduate students. Her main area of expertise resides in the area of international and comparative education. And um, she is a professional experienced researcher involved in numerous Horizon 2020 projects. And is, she's a chairperson for UCC's Research Staff Association and she was elected for the, to the International Officer for Ireland's National Research uh, Staff Association and is also Secretary and Director of the International Consortium of Researcher Staff Associations. Um, she's also a long-standing um, Fellow of London's Royal Society of Arts UK. As we begin the conversation, like I was saying, if you feel comfortable in sharing, you can type some of your experiences or barriers you have faced and, and your views on the topic into the um, chat box and we'll try address those during the conversation. Um, so a warm welcome to Dr. Rosari Griffin and I'll hand you over to her now for her presentation. Yeah. Um, can you see my screen? I just double check that. Oh, sorry. Yeah. We can now, Rosary. Rosary yeah, okay. and we can hear you now. Okay, great. Okay, thanks, a million. 
Okay, so um, why do women leave academia framework for retention? So what I did for tonight's presentation is that I had a look at, uh, I suppose, um, I'll just get rid of the screen here now because I can't see my own work. Hold on it. Um, that's better. Um, I had a look at um, recent documents, recent uh, recent events, and I, I have been involved in a number of recent events, so I thought I'd bring those results and those um, consultations to the floor tonight because it's more topical and more recent, recent. However, I just want to make reference and just go back a few years to the Gender Review of Higher Education 2016. Recently, I had a meeting with uh, uh, Simon Harris who is the, um, the Minister for Higher Education now. It's a relative, as you know, those of you who live in Ireland, it's a relatively new department. Originally, higher education came under the remit of the DES, Department of Education and Studies or Science. And now they've separated them off and it's um, a separate department for further in higher education. It's Ferris, it has a long title. In any case, we challenged them recently as to whether or not there has been any update and data in relation to the situation of staff in higher education. And his response has been that he is going to issue another review. Um, now, I have to say I'm very skeptical of reviews. I know they're a necessary evil, but I feel a bit jaded about this topic. Um, I feel these are issues that should have been resolved about 50 years ago maybe 30 at the most. Um, I can't believe in 2022, we're still discussing these issues. And in some cases, post pandemic, they appear to be getting worse rather than better. So I think it's a real indictment on the higher education system in Ireland, um, not to have made more of a, an attempt to resolve these issues sooner. But we are where we are, as the legal legals like to say. So we'll just, um, um, we'll just, I suppose, take a quick look back and then see what the path is going forward. So the review in 2016 supported an in-depth analysis of the gender balance of academics and non-academic staff across all the grades, as well as institutions. And the review, it says, has been forward-looking, adopting a qualitative enhancement approach to build on the sector's achievements to date. Um, now, I, I'm, I'm a little cynical, but nevertheless, we'll just, um, I'll park my own personal comments until the end. And on international best practice to shape future policy and practice in Ireland. So that would be great if it happened. Okay. Um, don't know if I'm able to move on the slide. Okay, so the results of this particular review were particularly damning in my opinion. Um, academic staff, if you look on the left, women versus men, so that was a total number of staff. If you look at the entry level graded academic positions, which is, you know, the um, under the bar and just over the bar positions. So they're more or less on par. However, by the time you go, you go up the, the um, promotional ladder, it, um, you can see the position of women is 19% uh, versus 81%. That's, that is one in every five is a woman when it comes to senior professor position. This is 2016, so that's not so long ago. I can't really imagine that the situation has changed drastically since, so I can't imagine the figures will be much better, but I could be pleasantly surprised. Um, the majority uh, believe there is, um, surprise, surprise, uh, gender inequality in Irish higher education. And to date only, uh, well, that was 2016, female presidents were 15%. I think we may have had one or 1 1.5 since then because there was an interim um, president um, in one of the colleges. And I think there's another female president in um, what used to be a technical college, um, I, um, institute, uh, which is now university. <laughs> So um, again, in, funny enough, in non-academic staff, which I will mention, um, it, the figures are rather flipped because you have about two thirds of, of the people in non-academic um, positions as predominantly administrative roles are women and a third men. Um, the women are lowest paid, 72% versus 
versus 28%. And yet um, the highest paid positions, it completely reverses where men, even in administrative roles, tend to, um, tend to rise to the top. So you have to say there is definitely systemic and structural um, problems in the system and possibly cultural, most likely cultural as well. And this really isn't good enough um, and these really need to be addressed. So the question that the review posed was, is there gender inequality? Um, it stated that gender inequality in higher education is an internationally observed issue. Okay, in other words, it's widespread, but it doesn't, it does, that doesn't make it any less excusable. And that women continue to be vastly underrepresented in top positions within the higher education sector, as well as in academic decision positions across Europe. Well, um, no great surprises there. Just going to the next slide. So a survey in 2016, now I'll come to the more recent surveys done, but made a list of suggestions of what needed to be changed and we all know what they are. So we're kind of rehashing old thoughts again. And in fact, I just recently filled out, as in yesterday, um, consultation survey, gender survey again in higher education, which I think asked all the same questions because the answers here were similar to the questions I was asked. And I can't imagine the answers will be any different this year to 2016, but you know, we, we, we look with interest. In fact, if anything, potentially figures may have got worse. But in any case, um, the staff suggested the, these are the things that need to be addressed, progression promotion and gender balance on, on management teams, the overall culture, career development opportunities, transparency procedures, um, senior management leadership on gender equality, representation, fair representation on key, key committees and childcare um, and care provision and supports. So none of that is anything new, I'm sure, to anybody listening on. <clears throat> now, as Mairead mentioned at the beginning, I'm involved in a number of different organizations, predominantly to do with research, although the, the, the issues um, go right across the institution. So um, as Mairead mentioned, I'm the chairperson of UCC's Research Staff Association. I'm a member of IFOOT, interested in precarity. We've put forward a motion for the annual um, ADC co conference coming up to do with precarity. Um, I'm one of the members of the Irish Precarity Network. Um, I'm the International Officer of the Irish Researcher Staff Association and I'm a Secretary and Director of the International Consortium of Research Staff Association. So the good thing about all of this is that it's the same issue I'm dealing with in relation to precarity from the local grassroots level, my institution at UCC, to the national level with the Irish RSA, to the international level with ICORSA. And so from, I suppose, from the point of view of having an overview, you get a good sense of what, you know, the policy issues and, um, and the issues at stake. Um, and it also, I suppose, brings maybe a richness to my understanding of the issues, but the issues have been around a long time. So, um, and we all know what they are. But one of the main reasons for the lack of retention is precarious contracts. And this is because, as we know, the neoliberal model of education, which has sort of come in the back door in education. And um, so much so that there is an awful, you know, there's a lot more people in higher education in terms of academics and researchers who are on precarious contracts. At the moment, the figures are over 40% and it could even be higher. So obviously precarious contracts give rise to a whole host of other issues like lack of progression, continuity, stability, uh, fewer promotional opportunities. Then of course there's the subconscious gender bias and you also have the cultural issue. I mean, we do live in a, still live in a very strong patriarchal society and that will be very difficult to overcome in relation to policies or to, to um, institute change and you have fewer career opportunities. 
So recently, not so long ago, about two months ago at the most, um, we had an, an online forum, a summit on precarity. And these were the um, some of the, we had a, we had a, a, a number of very high, le, um, high level policy speakers from the European Union and from various international organizations. And we put together um, a summary of the, recommendations and outcomes of this online um, summit. And one was that precarious contracts affects the well-being and mental health virtues, and I'm sure this also pertains to academics. Precarity negates um, the effort to promote diversity and gender equality, uh, which is a key emerging OECD point was that female postdocs have difficulty to continue in research after having children, for example. So um, let's move on here. Also, other issues that came to the fore um, as a result of the summit were the uh, precarity gives rise to lack of diversity, lack of intersexual mobility, and lack of international comparable data. So it's difficult if you don't have comparable data or even national data, it's really difficult to make policy or to convince policymakers of changes needed. So therefore, data does need to be systematically collected on all academic and research staff and their career trajectories in order to inform policy. I mean, this is pretty basic stuff. It's amazing that we actually have to say this in the higher education sector that, hello, we need to put together research on, our, on ourselves, actually. Um, we're not outside um, being researched. And there's also a lack of research awards, grants and fellowships at the appropriate levels beyond mid-career and a perceived lack of equity and inclusion strategies in practice. So that one of the common complaints is that beyond a certain level, the scholarships and the grants and the fellowships aren't there to support onward trajectory um, for people in their careers. So it seems to me that a lot of, um, a lot of academic work now is seen as just that work or jobs rather than a career, uh, which is not the way it should be. So the outcomes of the summit were that the disparity of research careers for women researchers compared to male researchers is becoming uh, wider as far as women researchers progress after postdoc positions, especially in academia. The leaky pipe phenomenon, as well as industry and the glass ceiling phenomenon. Um, we agreed that we would need another summit to address these issues alone and that some policy recommendations need to be identified. Well, we, ICORSA undertook um, an international survey and one of the key results was that females want to stay in research less than males. Now, it wasn't clear why, but it was the collective view, but this would need to be researched that um, it's because of the precarious environments, which are not gender friendly, nor are they family friendly. In short, gender inequality equality in terms of academic and research career progression needs to be focused in and of itself. So more needs to be done. Now, recent progress um, was that the HEA I launched a system-wide, I mentioned this, independent review. This is um, brought on by the minister and it's currently underway. And I think any consultations, so if anybody online is listening, I think you have until the end of this month, which is only Friday, to submit um, a, to make a submission. Um, in the last two or three years, I must be after making about 10 submissions to the HEA, to the, Ferris to um, different groups, IUA and different organizations that have requested it on behalf of UCCRSA. Um, but it would be nice to think that something comes out of these systematic reviews. This is the second such national review. I made a mention of it at the beginning, the national one in 2000 and um, the first national one in 2016. And it will assess the progress made in implementing the recommendations arising from the first national review and also the gender action plan. 
So recent developments of framework fraction, which is the title of tonight's talk. So the HEA established the Center of Excellence for Gender Equality 2020. This subsequently became the Center of Excellence for Equality, Diversion and Inclusion in 2020. Sorry, the first one was 2021 and then 2020. Um, and in relation to EDI matters, the center is commissioned to oversee a number of initiatives in relation to gender equality in higher education, including senior management, senior academic leadership initiatives, um, gender equality enhancement fund, the Athena Swan Charter, and the annual publication of staff data by gender. Now, what's interesting here is that the we have got to date most of our information from the Athena Swan, which is an EU-driven um, policy. And that has been very instructive for us in understanding the gender breakdown um, of data which is gathered in the Irish higher education system. So it was actually externally imposed by EU and it will become a condition of getting research in the future to have the gold, silver or bronze Athena Swan Awards. So this is good news from, I suppose, from um, for Irish education, for Irish higher education. But again, it's um, it's driven by the EU. It would be nice to see things driven nationally as well. So it remains to be seen whether these developments will address the major gender imbalances in the Irish higher education system. Um, so the Sally Initiative, if I to back, that was one of the four key things. This was where under the previous minister. Um, it was a national call for professorships, which were just dedicated professorships for females only. That was seen as probably a radical approach to um, radical approach to redressing the huge imbalance at the senior level. If you remember here, I just go back. The Sally is the is this is the first one there, the Senior Academic Leadership Initiative, SALI. So um, that, that's positive action. And I think positive action is probably in some ways the only way to go in order to create cultural change. Um, it is envisaged that 45 senior academic leadership posts would be awarded to HEIs over three years to assist in accelerating gender balance at senior levels. Now this potentially could be challenged ironically under equality legislation, but I think if we got pretty good SC senior councils on board, I think the arguments wouldn't last very long. Okay, um, results from a recent Trinity College survey. So this is the equality survey. So 71%, so this is the most recent survey that came out. And the one good thing about Trinity is that it does publicize this data. Um, I feel that other institutions like to somehow mask these kind of results or they kind of, they sort of get hidden beyond layers of other stats. So 71% of respondents felt they are limited to pro promotions and career progression opportunities. That's like almost three quarters. Only 20% of all staff have confidence in the, pro in other words, 80% don't. And 12% of research staff are optimistic about getting an acad uh, academic position. 88% are not optimistic, or as 80%, 88% don't feel optimistic or may not know, but may not have responded, but or may have said don't know. But in any case, there's only 12% who are optimistic. So this is this doesn't augur well. It doesn't indicate at least that there has been much progress in the last few years. Apologies for having an um, overtly negative view but and um, possibly cynical but I'm afraid the evidence speaks for itself so there's no point in sugarcoating the facts the facts stand for themselves so I was part of uh, as I mentioned the Irish Precarious Network and we recently made a submission to the HEA in relation to and the Oireachtas um, Oireachtas Committee for Education which is um, a, a government committee. 
and so I'm a signature to this particular uh, submission. Um, and I've taken uh, sections of our report that we submitted for the benefit, for everybody's benefit. Um, so this is where it comes from. Cortis and O'Keefe research and academic precarity indicates huge discrepancies across and within Irish HEIs with a lack of standardization on contracts, pay and entitlements found even within departments. Uh, and then we have an example, for example, uh, remuneration for core teaching extensively um, relies on hourly paid work. Many, especially women, carried out core teaching functions across Irish universities, institutes and colleges and are doing so while needing to rely on social welfare support. And we had quite a few cases to support that. Now, going back to one of the better reports uh, published by the government was the Cush report um, chaired by a senior counsel, Michael Cush, known as the Cush report. And he found that almost 13,000 lecturing staff were precariously employed in the Irish higher education system, majority of whom were women. And recently this film, this figure has been confirmed. So noteworthy in their data from 17 of the 22 HEIs, they counted 11,200 lecturers on average per year employed precariously in Ireland, while over 50% of all Irish lecturing staff are employed on either part-time or temporary contract. Again, this would not give rise to security of tenure. It doesn't give rise to career progression. Um, if anything, it's quite the opposite. Um, so consequently, a growing number of academics, especially women, experience employment insecurity at critical life stages. Higher education employer bodies acknowledge that low hour, hours employment as a main source of income can be problematic. And that's putting it mildly. Um, lecturers, especially women in this situation, have no career path and can find themselves teaching new modules every year in multiple institutions on very short time contracts with very limited time to where such working and living conditions are unsustainable. And I suspect this is why so many do leave the system. So the expansion of the neoliberal model of education is a cost-saving measure employed by institutions in order to, I suppose, short, shortcut the, um, the fact that the government have cut, um, cut down in central funding for the third level sector in Ireland in the last number of years. So this has obviously created um, a dearth of a hole in the finances. And so they turned to labor as a means of making savings at the expense of the workers and most particularly women. And this also impacts on EDI issues. So every year, HEIs across Ireland depend on approximately 13,000 precarious employed lecturers to provide teaching. Cush, again, who I mentioned, such lecturers are significantly underpaid, with no entitlement to sick pay, pensions, maternity or paternity leave, or other statutory rights. They're just often paid for teaching hours, but they're expected to give the full level of administrative duties. And we all know what that means. Everything from aggresso to everything to canvas and inputting on grades and, and pastoral care as their full-time permanent colleagues, despite the extraordinary discrepancy in pay. And these lecturers are working without any institutional support and often only employed and paid for the 12 to 15 weeks of term. So that means they're effectively unemployed for the rest of the time and they have to go on job seekers allowance. So that's why they have to rely on social welfare, which is really, um, a disgrace to say the least. So all of the research there has been based on the following. Um, I, I need to add the Cush report and a few others. So I'm afraid I, I, I am, a, I am um, ending on a quite a negative note, except to say this, this further review, um, hopefully some more positive action. And I think we need positive action. I think we need legislative positive action in order to bring about to force, we have to force at this stage, institutional change, if anything is to, if anything is to change. And that's my take on it. So feel free to disagree. 
Thank you. <coughs> um, will I stop sharing my screen now? Yeah, please. That would be great, Rosari. Thanks very much for that. That was very enlightening, if if a little bit disheartening. All right. Um, a couple of observations, I suppose, on on your presentation. Um, like I was saying, it's it's frustrating um, and disheartening that the issues haven't changed much <laughs> over the last, uh, well, since 2016 and, and before that even. Um, you mentioned there about um, legislative action being needed. What Could you elaborate a little bit on that? What, what do you mean by that? Yes, I, I think quotas, quotas have to come in. Uh, I think quotas have to be compulsory. If you look back and we say general gender legislation in um, across Europe um, in the 1970s, I think. Yeah, I think it was the 1970s in Denmark. Um, they brought about gender quotas in politics. For example, this is just an example. By 1998, they were able to rescind that legislation because they had reached parity. So in other words, they had to bring in a legislative change for quotas in order to force people to, to change their cultural habits or cultural norms or expectations. We're still debating in 2022 here whether or not we should have quotas in politics. I mean, this is 50 years later. And if you look at, we'll say the doll, for example, we're nowhere near, anywhere near um, gender parity. So, I don't know what this tinkering around the edges is about the whole time. You know, the problem is as obvious as that day and night to me, it's like black and white. I actually feel that our education system is almost like an apartheid system. Insofar as if you paint on, um, uh, if you look at the diagram of any university and you put all the men in white and you put all the women in black, you would actually think you're looking at an apartheid system, in my opinion because it's that blatant. Now there has been incremental changes, such as the Athena Swan that has brought about, and forcibly again, because of Europe. We, I don't think we can even take credit for that. And it's because the funding that we're getting from Europe, you know, a lot of it now will be tied to having the Athena Swan medals, you know, either the gold, silver, or bronze. So it's in our own interest to get those medals in order to qualify to apply for EU funding. But again, that's forcing change. That is not coming, that is not coming about, you know, organically here. It's, it's, it's again being superimposed upon us. And from that point of view, it's a really good thing because otherwise I'd imagine we'd still be back in the dark ages, which were, in my opinion, which we're close to, but I, I, I you know, I just, I'm so tired of filling out gender equality surveys. I mean, I think if you do fill one out, and I would encourage everybody here to fill out the gender survey, which probably has been circulated in your institution and give it the worst rating ever in order for change to come about. I mean, I think you have to be, you know, pussyfooting around, oh, you know, maybe, or, no, I think you have to be pretty sure of your opinion. Like you either feel like it's a fair system and then, you know, okay make uh, mark the survey accordingly or you feel it's actually not a fair system and I'm fed up with this and in that case you you make your feelings known through the survey and you say strongly disagree or strongly agree depending on which and don't bother with anything in between you just really have to and any opportunity to write in the text box take it mm. because they might use it as quotations yeah and it might resonate more with the um, people analyzing the survey. So I do think I would stress, I would really encourage people to be radical because, because nothing is going to change otherwise. It does seem like there has been a lot of surveys, I suppose, and nothing's been translated into action. Um, so, and one of the things that struck me from your talk was that, um, you know, the, the conditions that women are working under in academia and research are unsustainable. And I suppose, yeah from an emotional and psychological point of view and in terms of living conditions and um, they're definitely unsustainable and something has to change um 
I apologize or I'm going to apologize because there seems or due to unforeseen circumstances, we don't have our second speaker, um, Pam Davis. And um, so we're just going to move on to um, the Q&A session and open the questions to the floor. Um, if that's OK with you, Rosary. Perfect. Yeah. OK. Um, Okay, I'll kick it off. I have I have one question here. Um, so you mentioned the Cush report that uh, demonstrated in 2016 that 11,000 lecturers were on temporary contracts, and um, Maria Delaney, Delaney's report showed that it's it's even higher now. So um, are we more likely are we likely to see more funding for permanent contracts in the next few years, or do you think this trend is going to keep continuing in the next few years? Oh, that's a really good question. Um... I would like to think that it won't continue, but I can't see it changing. So that's the short answer. Um, I can't see it changing unless um, Simon Harris really takes a really very strong view on this. I mean, he can and he should, but um, um, I can't see it changing. Not unless I think the funding model has to change. Um, for higher education because I think that's what's driving it I know because I was on governing body in UCC for three terms of office I was elected on and between there was one 10 years period that it lost about 40 percent of its core budget um, if not more I can't quite remember now but it was a massive drop and you know I suppose they tried to cut corners uh, and they do that by, um, by you know, the um, employing people precariously. Now, in a way, that's almost led to a two-tier system in 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 higher education. You have people who are very well paid and people really poorly paid. And um, I don't think that has been, I don't think that has been good. Because we say an institution, I uh, saw like an IFOOT, for example, they have all members as part of their membership. So it can create difficulties. Um, does that answer the question? Yes, completely. Thank you. I'll hand you over to my colleague, Anna. Hi, thank you for the very interesting talk. I have one more question from Lorna Rowe, and she asks whether has anyone taken an intersectional perspective to the issue of gender equality? How of the women who are promoted, what percentage have family and are from a higher SES background? And of the gender quotes spoken about again, has anyone analyzed who got those promotions? Um. A quick answer to that is I don't know, but I think they're excellent questions and definitely worth investigating. I think in relation to the latter part of the question, she's referring to the Sally, um, the 45 senior academic um, posts which are created. Um, that was under the previous minister, um, Minister Mary, I can't remember her name now, Mary, she's a double barrel surname. Um, so that was one of her initiatives. Um, in a way, it was a very blunt instrument to address, you know, a systemic issue. But I mean, at least, you know, you, one could be critical of it, but at least you could say it was some positive action towards, um, towards uh, trying to level the playing field, especially at the senior level. But it was very blunt. And I think the system, the problem with that is that um it, it's, it sort of almost um negates the fact that it's a systemic and cultural problem as much as anything else as well as economic and social yeah. thank you okay i think we have one more question that joanne is going to ask uh, there was a comment from marcella linkova um i think it was in in response to one of your previous points um she says she has to beg to differ. The introduction of 
the Athena Swan in Ireland was preceded by a long stretch of the GEP requirement in Horizon Europe. Um, it was indigenous, if you will. So unless Marcella would like to um, mention a little bit about that, you're welcome to. But um, yeah, have you anything in response to Marcella's comment? Um, yeah, well, you know, uh, maybe Marcella would like to expand on that. It certainly wasn't, I, I, I don't believe it was an Irish initiative. I think it, that um, Athena Swan originated in, if I remember Norwich University in the UK or Nottingham University. That was there, that's where, that's where that initiative was first um, um, developed. But maybe, I, I mean, I beg Marcella, I'd be delighted if you could elaborate on that comment. No, um, sorry, if I misunderstood. Um, I did not realize that you were referring to the original UK initiative. And um, thank you very much for, you know, brilliant um, um, analysis and diagnosis of the situation which we are battling, I think, across the EU. I mean, I could wholeheartedly support everything that you're saying in terms of the uh, precarity and the proportions we are facing, I would say pretty much the same. Um, what I think, I mean, but when we look at the EU today, um, um, the Irish uh, Athena Swan uh, gender equality plan requirement, I have to say is quite unique. And so for me, it's really important to hear um, the um, reflections on the shortcomings of the system and the continued um, you know, issues that are not being rectified because it is one of the most robust frameworks that are in place in the EU. So if it does not work in Ireland and from the reflections uh, shared today, you know, I, these are very serious, then we really have to ask what evaluation uh, framework uh, for gender equality actions we should adopt uh, to actually measure progress. Yes. I think that this is, this is a really important, this is a very important question and maybe just for the sake of uh, uh, transparency I will say that I am the uh, one international uh, person uh, foreign person on the uh, uh, gender equality review that is being conducted by the higher education authority so just you know so so that that's clear yeah perfect yeah um thank you for that intervention um and I am a big fan of the Athena Swan I mean I, I think I meant that's where we got a lot of our data from when we were doing our reports for the various um, for the various um, submissions for the HEA, for Ferris, for the IUA, for uh, RIA, and a few other European ones. Um, we got a lot of the gender data from Athena Swan, which were I think we were able to find in the public domain, which was very useful because that kind of disaggregated data wasn't necessarily available from our own institutions. I, I think Trinity are the most transparent in that respect. Um, and yeah. unless it's sought, it, unless it's looked for, it won't, it won't be given, you know, we have to. Yeah. Hi, sorry. Um, just uh, we actually have our second speaker. Oh, um, sorry, Doctor. Um, Doctor or Professor Davis um, is on the line now. Um, apologies for the mix up. Um, hi, Professor Davis. Hello. Good evening. Hi. And um, so I'm just going to give a brief introduction um, to our audience um, about yourself, and then I'll, I'll hand it over to you to um, to present. Okay. Um, so. I'm delighted to introduce our second speaker, um, Professor um, Pamela Davis is the Airline H and Curtis F Garvin Research Professor and Professor at the Centre for Community Health Integration, Case Western Reserve University, um, the School of Medicine in Cleveland, Ohio. She holds a BSc in Chemistry, a Doctorate in Physiology and um, Pharmacology and has a medical, medical degree. In 2014, Dr. Davis was inducted into the Institute of Medicine, now known as the National Academy of Medicine. Um, she uh, has 
over 150 peer-reviewed publications um, in the area of cystic fibrosis is her main area of research. But in 2021, her research um, shift, shifted to using informatic approaches in large databases to gain insight into important clinical problems, most recently, most recently the reciprocal interaction of COVID and chronic conditions. Um, she has, yeah, like I was saying, she has over 50, 150 peer-reviewed publications. Um, so if it's okay with you, Pamela, are you okay to share your slides? Absolutely. Okay, thank you. All right, I'm going to try to put these. Uh, the host disabled my participant screen sharing. So either you show them or you give me permission. I just made you co-host, so you should be able to share. So I appreciate the opportunity to, to speak with you. Um, as, uh, as you know, I'm from the United States and uh, about a, uh, a few months into the pandemic, it became clear to us that things were not going well for women, uh, junior, particularly junior faculty and researchers in the, um, in the United States. Uh, I'm a member of the board of directors of the Clinical Research Forum, which uh, advocates for everything important, uh, everything we think is important about clinical research, and certainly uh, the uh, contribution of women faculty to clinical research is absolutely critical. And we were concerned about uh, about what was going on as the pandemic uh, uh, got into the uh, uh, into uh, a year. Um, the social norms that were obvious during the pandemic really worked against women. They're considered default caregivers. They're professional women who are already starved for time, who, who assume a disproportionate share, household chores and caregiving, and honestly, not advancing work at the office. Uh, women get assigned things that do not advance careers, uh, and often men don't. During the pandemic, caregiving support for children and elders just dried up. And also, at least in the United States, some research labs closed. So researchers who were laboratory-based had issues. Uh, Non-COVID clinical research halted because there was uh, considered to be danger in bringing people in for such studies. And in addition, everybody had to learn a new way of communicating and talking and uh, operating um, largely on things like, uh, like Zoom. This was superimposed on a background that was not, uh, not exactly stellar for women. Um, in the United States, the proportion of women in rank up through assistant professor is as expected uh, from the pool, but there are many fewer women than expected as associate professors, full professors, department chairs, and deans and promotion uh, for women has been slower. Women get paid less than men, even controlling for specialty and job. So paying for some of the things on the outside that uh, is useful for decompressing them is uh, more, more difficult. They also in the United States get less money for startup packages than men, which is problematic in getting your lab going. Um, in the United States, women publish less and their papers are cited less, even papers that get published in top journals, even papers in top journals. And they hold fewer of the large prestigious grants and their grant uh, uh, portfolio tends to be more towards the starter grants. The additional, uh, so the, re the results of this, uh, of the pandemic for women in academic medicine were as you might predict from all those things. The additional time required at home came out of research in academia. There were fewer first or last authored papers submitted by women, yet conversely, men submitted more papers uh, during the pandemic time. The grants submitted by women during the pandemic time in the US requested less money. And more women than men turned down new higher level jobs. And if the women had dependents at home, there were three times the rejections of higher level jobs among women with dependents at home than there were among women 
who did not have dependents at home. So I thought that was one of the most tragic things at all of all. So what can we do? Um, our group, the Academic Advancement Committee from the Clinical Research Forum, debated for quite a while as to what to recommend. And ultimately, we had a paper uh, published as a commentary in Nature Medicine. One of the key things is to put some money into this. We need funding for additional help at work, lab technicians, administrative help. Our charities are offering support, the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation, joined by several others in the United States, offered uh, support for salary for uh, um, technicians and laboratory help. But we also think the institutions need to step up. You, you can't just say, well, we didn't get the grant, so you know that's tough. And in addition, there are other things that institutions can do uh, to see that uh, the uh, brain power of women is properly utilized in research. I think we need to assure that there are comparable startup packages. And for those who have already had startup packages, they need to have catch-up funding. They need to be able to have the same opportunity to develop their work. In the United States, uh, it's not a given that you can have childcare uh, for uh, very young children. And locating quality childcare is very challenging. And it's also challenging to find elder care. Um, the institutions could help with this and could provide some kind of support in paying for it. In our system, there's an opportunity for giving uh, uh, tax, uh, for allowing a portion of salary to be set aside tax free to pay for childcare, and that should be done more widely. In addition, there the federal government has stepped up, and for people in train, for women in training who have childcare responsibilities has provided $2,500 a year, not that much, but it's something toward childcare. And they're starting to extend that for people with starter grants. So we really need to be thinking about childcare as an infrastructure piece and not as something that's a frill or an add-on. But the big thing is that we really need to change the culture. And as you all know, that's not so easy. Um, it needs to be both top down and bottom up. And when I say top down, it needs to, needs to be endorsed by the boards of governors, boards of directors, boards of trustees. It needs to be made a priority for our leadership, our presidents, our deans. And it also needs to bubble up from the bottom. Um, it needs to become more of a societal norm. And those are things that are difficult to do, but are things that we need to... Uh, to consider and work toward. I think the most important aspect and the most immediate aspect is putting some more money into what's going on um, uh, in the laboratories of women uh, researchers, both from our charitable foundations and from uh, the institutions at which they work. So I'm gonna stop sharing I, and uh, see what uh, anybody else has to uh, has to say about, uh, about that. Our group uh, had a very good um, discussion and uh, you'll find in the paper a much more detailed uh, explanation of what we were thinking about when we needed, uh, when we made our recommendations. So thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Davis for sharing that. And I've just shared the um, link to the paper with our attendees. Um, if anyone has any questions for Professor Davis, um, if you can post them in the chat and we'll try answer one or, or ask her to answer one or two of them. Um, I suppose one of the things that struck me about your paper was the childcare infrastructure. In Ireland, we have major issues with childcare um, costs for, for, I suppose, not just for academic um, women, but um, women in, in the workforce in general. And, um, it's interesting that you know the funding is available in, in the US for childcare. Um, I suppose child, um, to support women in in the workplace. Um, it's definitely something that that's that's needed here. Um, is it becoming more common um, to have have childcare funding with with, with grants? Uh, well, it is. I don't think it's widely known in the United States either. And I also think that that's something of an indictment of our administrative structure because they really ought to know about this and tell people who are eligible, gee whiz, yeah. you know, you really ought to be able to, uh, to do that. 
Uh, it's relatively recent. It's only in the last few years that that's become available. It's available on training grants on uh, right now. So if you're a postdoc or you're a graduate student, you can get that $2,500. Of course, they don't pay you very much mm. uh, on those grants, but now they're starting to put it into the starter grants on the, um, uh, uh, on, uh, that, that come out of the NIH, uh, the K-series awards for junior faculty. So I think that that's becoming more common. I do think that the providing additional hands to decompress the time of women, the most valuable resource we all have is time. And to decompress the time of women in the laboratory is important. To decompress the time of women at home and to decompress the time of women doing other things. Mm, definitely, yeah. Um, okay, I think we're just gonna open the floor to um, questions that have come in from the attendees. Uh, I'll hand you over to my colleague, Joanne. I'll actually ask the first one. Anna, uh, so sorry, the first apologies, one, Anna. Oh, don't worry. Uh, the first one is from Lorna Rowe. And she says, excellent talk. I think the supports are sensible in terms of changing the culture, particularly where senior academics who are typically male are mentoring early career females. How can you address the unconscious conscious bias which might emerge in these conversations? Well, uh, I think you can be aware of it. I will say that I guess you might have predicted from the time during which I came up through the ranks. Um, I would say all of my mentors were men. And uh, you just have to be aware that they have a little bit of an angle on things and they have expectations that are a little bit different. Um, I was fortunate to have a, a male mentor and for my postdoc at the National Institutes of Health who believed that he was the potter familius, he was the father, and everybody who ever worked for him was uh, uh, his son or his daughter and they sh we should all consider one another siblings. And if it was within our power to do something for someone else, we should do it. And that group was very powerful for me just because of the expectation that he set, the notion that if somebody needs you, you should, uh, you should help. And honestly, I bore up my end of the bargain too. When some of them needed something, I participated. I think you have to expect that nobody comes to any mentoring relationship uh, entirely pure of heart. Um, but uh, I think you have, and as long as you realize that, I think it's fine. By the way, I think nobody should have only one mentor. I mean, in our most successful training program, you have a career mentor and you have a research mentor. And you have others around that, but we absolutely require that you have a career mentor who isn't advising your research and a research mentor who may advise your career, but you know, his principal job is to make sure that you develop as a, as a scientist. So I think you should not think of yourself as, as confined to a single mentor. You may have a whole bevy of them and different mentors at different times in your life. Thank you very much. This is a really important point, I think, and a very good advice. I'll give the floor to Joanne to ask the next question. Ah, I see a question about paternity leave. Was that the uh, was that the uh, question? Yes. Yeah. No, I think you have to be fair about this. I think that uh, people need to have um, uh, the opportunity to participate in early childhood development. And uh, I, think it's, uh, I think it's a good idea. Um, I also think that putting pressure on women to come back too early is, uh, you know, is, is imposing a, an unnecessary stress. So in the United States, there is no, re uh, you know, the, re the requirements are, are very, very low. And um, it's, uh, it's been difficult. I actually went to battle with the NIH over the training grant requirements where they made us use another whole year of salary if the woman happened to have her baby at the end of one year and you know, the, uh, the maternity leave extended into the next year, you lost a whole year of, of support 
on that. And that was ridiculous. So the NIH has kind of fixed that now. Uh, and I think that that's a good thing. But I think uh, broadening the expectation of who does what um, is, is very important. Is there any more questions? Um, we have one follow up uh, from Leanne uh, asking, um, she says that she also has recently been frustrated with male colleagues not citing her work where appropriate. And she's wondering how should one approach this conversation? Well, I think you usually try to approach things in a positive way until you learn that you can't. So, you know, maybe you, uh, maybe you go and you say, I have a paper that's absolutely relevant to what you're, you've been working on and I wanted you to know about it. And could we talk about this uh, and, uh, and see what we each, uh, each think about it? Um, I, you know, I think you try to approach it in a non-judgmental uh, manner. You know, I have to confess, you know, you know I, I am guilty of not necessarily citing everything that's, that's out there and I don't mean not to. And, uh, you know, sometimes it's enough just to, uh, just to point that out. If, however, it's a kind of a slight or a deliberate skim over, then you sort of have to talk about it. How can, how can I make this a more compelling paper? What do you think? And if you don't get with that, maybe you need to talk to your chair or your mentor about just how to, how to do this. I think most people respond, respond to things more positively personally, but you know, sometimes it just doesn't work. I think we have time for one more question. Um, and Joanne, do you want to read out the one about mentor positively? Or, or will I, can you see that question? Uh, we have one further up from Rebecca Boyd. Oh, she says, I know today is a specific women in research event, but what about men? Where men don't want to help or to mentor? Hmm. Well, mentoring is something that needs to be a two-way street, and I'm not sure I'd want to mentor or didn't want to talk to me. So I think you need to find the, it's not really going the route of least resistance. It's, got, it's finding the route of, of most benefit. And, uh, you know, I, uh, I just, uh, I don't think I'd go pick out someone who was, uh, was not so hot. And sometimes over time, um, things change. I, I, I trained it at, uh, at Duke and the, in medicine and the very, very best teacher in the world was a young man who uh, had been a chief resident and he would be there at midnight and he'd be talking about the cases and he never initiated a conversation with a woman, never. He would respond if a woman asked him a question but he would never initiate the conversation. And I was there as a student and I was there as a, re as a house officer as well. And towards the end of my house officer uh, time at three o'clock in the morning, I was leaving a, a room in the emergency room and I felt a hand on my shoulder and I turned around and it was this brilliant guy. And he said, you know, I used to think that there was no place for women in medicine, but you and Judy Swain and Kate Hale, you've convinced me otherwise, bravo. And he trundled on off you know, at the end of the time. So sometimes it actually works and sometimes that uh, people change their mind. If you just live your life and do your thing and do well, and uh, sometimes it changes. Thank you very much. That's great advice. And um, thank you, Professor Davis. Um, so I'm gonna finish up. Now, and I just want to thank our panelists, Professor Davis and Dr. Griffin, for giving their time and insights into this important topic. Um, and I want to thank the um, Women in Research 
um, committee for helping with um, the questions and tonight's event. And I want to thank all the attendees as well for this enlightening um, discussion. And um, so I wish you all um, a good evening and thanks again for joining.